Okay, I think it is time to start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, so today we start our third um, Landscapes Live online seminar. And you can see here the, the slide with the, with the description of this, uh, the different slots. So today we welcome uh, Professor Robert Hilton, Bob Hilton uh, from Durham University. So I will give you a few information about the, the seminar itself and how it will, um, it will happen. So today, so my name is Pierre Valla. I'm, uh, I will chair this, uh, this online seminar and I will co-chair with Steffi Toffelder and Philippe Steyr that you can see uh, the videos at home. So the idea is that we will listen to Bob for the next 45 minutes or so. And then at the end, we will welcome a question and discussion. Um, so for the moment, you cannot do anything as participants, but we will allow you to, um, um, to either chat at the end of the talk, uh, to, so to put your questions in the chat, and, um, then, and then to, have, um, to raise your hand. So you will, be, you will see for the moment the chat is disabled, but it will be open uh, after the talk. And if you go to participants um, button, you can also see at the bottom of the link, you can also raise your hand if you prefer to speak with the, the microphone. Uh, so I think this is all for now. So today we will record um, the talk on the questions. Um, and this will be put online on YouTube afterwards. So I think this is all, and I also put the schedule for the next seminars. So please remember and join if you can, and if you want the next uh, two seminars for this series. So I think I didn't forget anything. If I forget anything, Philippe or Steffi, uh, is it fine? Okay, so I will now introduce briefly uh, Bob Hilton. Um, uh, who we are very happy to welcome for this talk. So. Bob Hilton is professor at Durham University on um, a brief, um, a brief uh, bio, bio. So he did his uh, studies at the uh, University of Cambridge on, uh, in natural geological sciences, and then got his PhD in 2009 at the University of Cambridge, uh, working on the erosion of uh, organic carbon in mountain belts. Uh, then he left quickly uh, for France and did a postdoc post at uh, IPG Paris uh, after coming back briefly on the other side of, uh, of the channel. And then he joined Durham University in 2009, first as a lecturer, then as a reader, and uh, now as a professor. So he's working um, on weathering, on uh, erosion rates, on how this, um, this processes operates at the Earth's surface and act to transfer carbon between the atmosphere to the lithosphere as a geological storage. And is also looking deeply into the feedbacks between the carbon transfers and climate uh, system, how one can uh, interact with the other. So this is really a very exciting topic and I'm looking forward to hear more about uh, the recent uh, work that he has been doing uh, with this group. So I will now stop sharing my screen. Uh, Bob, I think you will be able then to share your screen and uh, we will listen to you. So we will switch off our cameras, but uh, we are still there, no worries. <laughs> Great, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invite. And actually, well, first of all, can everybody hear me? Is the, is the connection good? Can somebody give me a little thumbs up yes, or something? Yes, we can yes, hear. I can see some thumbs up. Great, um, yeah, and thank because uh, sorry the organizers for putting this together this is a really great initiative um, and I'm sure like many of, of you I am now relatively okay at using zoom uh, I didn't really know anything about it before uh, mid-march but I don't think anybody did um, so let's see how this goes I'm going to share my screen hopefully the right one And is it in presentation mode? How are we doing? There we go. So yes, thank you. Um, uh, hang on, it's it's not in presentation mode. We can see your. Oh, ah, now it is. Yes. How's that? Okay. That's good. Thanks. Great. 
Um, also, give me a shout if um, my connection's not very good. So give me a shout if, it, if I seem to be talking about something that is not on your screen. I'll try and keep asking that question. Um, yeah, I've got this theme that I wanted to talk about, which is how mountain building and erosion uh, impacts the carbon cycle. And um, Pierre did a really nice summary of why we're trying to, to, to get at that. And I'll cover some of those themes today. Um, and this is work that's, that's, there's many collaborators. I've listed a few here on the front page who um, have contributed to some of the things I'll show today. Uh, but there's a wider range of people whose papers I'll cite. Um, and also my work on this has been funded by the European Research Council through a starting grant, Rock CO2. Uh, and also elements of this uh, by the, the UK uh, Natural Environment Research Council. So by way to start, and I apologise if you've seen me talk to, before, you will feel like you might have seen a slide like this several times over, but um, I'm going to mix it up as in I think we want to move away from a kind of textbook version of this to something that's emerging. So this is how erosion uh, and weathering are impacting the carbon cycle. And we're interested here in, in the geological carbon cycle, the long-term transfers between uh, the lithosphere and the atmosphere ocean system. Uh, and we have a, a, a leak of CO2 continuously coming out of volcanism, volcanoes around the world, uh, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere and ocean system. And if this was just left unchecked, we'd end up with um, very high concentrations of this gas in the atmosphere um, and a situation that we haven't seen through Earth's history. And the reason for that is that we think that weathering um, reactions are really key in removing the CO2 from the atmosphere. So specifically, uh, this yellow box here showing uh, the weathering of silicate minerals. And this is done with carbonic acid. And this moves carbon from the atmosphere into waters, uh, river waters, uh, where it's transported to the oceans. And the products of those reactions can be used to make new calcium carbonate um, in rocks. And this is a, a, a way of getting the CO2 out of the system. And so there's been an awful lot of work to, to therefore understand what's controlling silicate weathering and how it responds to different perturbations, uh, all incredibly well justified, as you can hopefully see uh, for the fluxes there, that this is a really important transfer. Um, and this, this work is highlighting this pathway of CO2 drawdown. Uh, there's a simple conceptual um, equation there pulled from a paper, uh, which is demonstrating if you mix CO2 with water, you can react with a mineral uh, and you can then hopefully see that that carbon ends up in another compound that's bicarbonate which can dissolve in water and you can use that to make new carbonate and sequester CO2 over long time periods and this is happening um, when when rocks are interacting with with water and, and gas um, near Earth's surface uh, in this kind of critical zone as we as we conceptualize it um, and these reactions have been have been really key uh, throughout Earth's history and there's another reason for that and it's because the reaction itself offers a way to provide a negative feedback which can stabilize climate um, through the carbon cycle. And this is coming about because the reactions can be moderated by changes in temperature, changes in runoff, um, and also uh, changes in CO2 in the atmosphere and or in soils. And so there have been various attempts to try and get at this with empirical data, with modeling approaches. Um, I'm just going to show you an example of, of one of these, but they all converge at the same kind of point. Uh, and this is that you have this climatic control. Uh, so this is a, a Josh West uh, paper summarizing this. So here's a vertical axis, which is the runoff. You could also plot this with, with temperature. Uh, and the colors here are the weathering rates. So you can think of that as CO2 sequestration. So red is, is high rates of CO2 transfer from the atmosphere by this reaction. Um, the other, the key axis, axis here, and many geomorphologists on this, on this call, I'm very sure, is this denudation rate, which obviously if we increase physical erosion, we can in increase this denudation rate. And therefore, hopefully what you can see here is that at high denudation rates, this is where we have this strong climatic feedback, where if we change runoff, we get a really big change in weathering and we can draw down more CO2 um, uh, for, for higher runoff. Whereas if we're at low denudation or low erosion, uh, we end up with actually quite a weak climatic feedback. Um, and this is something that's been, that's been really important in helping us understand how the earth system and the carbon cycle operates, um, has been used recently in papers last year by, um, uh, caves and others uh, trying to look at how this reaction responds to erosion and, and links to climate. Uh, and we can kind of come up with broad brush things like this, you know, if you increase runoff or temperature, you increase these fluxes, these carbon drawdowns. 
And then a key statement, which is that erosion is acting to make this reaction more sensitive to climate. So that means mountainous areas, steep areas, are places where the silicate weathering reaction can respond to changes in, in climate. So um, a lot of the kind of, so, the, so one view of this cycle is that you kind of have a bit of a push and pull here. Um, if volcanic degassing increases and you release more CO2, silicate weathering does the work of mopping that up through these feedbacks that I've just described. Or if volcanic degassing was to decline, um, silicate weathering would respond, it would, it would slow down and you would end up with kind of a moderation of atmospheric CO2. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with anything I've just said, except that we're aware that in terms of erosion and weathering, there are a whole set of key other processes that are operating that we're trying to, I'm trying to summarize now in this diagram. So silicate weathering's just moved off to the side, it hasn't disappeared. And these fluxes are in megatons of carbon per year again still. And there are two actual sources of CO2 to the atmosphere that are associated with weathering. These are weathering of, of rocks that contain sulfide minerals, such as pyrite, and this oxidation of sulfide minerals can release CO2. And I'll talk about that briefly today. I don't have much time, unfortunately, to go into that pathway. Um, if we expose sedimentary rocks that contain organic carbon, this can be oxidized and released as CO2, a kind of geo-respiration process. We can also have another drawdown process, which is highlighted by the yellow uh, boxes, which is if we erode um, vegetation and soil from the landscape and move that through uh, systems into sedimentary deposits, we can store that for long periods of time, acting as another drawdown process in parallel to silicate weathering. Hopefully you can see from the fluxes here that each of these is really worthy of consideration. And to understand therefore how erosion and weathering are, are working, we need to understand what's going to cause these to uh, shift and change uh, in space and time. And so that's what I'm going to try and cover today. I gave you the kind of like 101 on silicate weathering. There's an awful lot more going on and there's still things we need to learn about silicate weathering, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to instead bring us uh, to, to a similar point in terms of discussing what we know about the erosion of organic carbon and its potential to be a CO2 sink. I'm going to focus on one of the pathways by which weathering can act as a CO2 source, and this is through rock derived organic carbon oxidation, this, this term OC petro, if I use it without uh, defining it. Um, and one of the ways we're getting at that, which is through some proxy approaches where we're using trace metals to try and track this oxidation. Um, so I'll give an example of using rhenium uh, to do that. And then I'll, I'll take a bit of a step back and pull, pull these processes together and say, what do we know about how erosion is influencing these carbon transfers? And actually try and show some um, examples of where we can kind of trade these off against each other in specific points at a surface and say how are they kind of operating. And I should say that this is very much based on a kind of modern catchment, uh, trying to quantify modern rates of processes to look at how these things are working. Um, so there's not, I don't have time to get into any of the, the really great modeling work that's, that's going on across uh, these kind of themes. Um, but yeah, there's many people I'm sure in the audience who um, could, could deliver a fantastic talk on that. Uh, and then I'll try and give a synthesis uh, and a view forward for, for um, my views anyway on this. So this CO2 sink by astral biosphere, I thought it's was, was a good excuse to show some very nice photos of places we can't visit. Um, well, unless you're in New Zealand. And um, this is the Southern Alps of New Zealand covered in, in dense temperate rainforest. Um, and this vegetation and soil and these really steep landscapes can be eroded and that carbon can be transferred uh, downstream through rivers um, where it's if its fate is in a kind of sedimentary deposit that lasts for a long period of time then you and you biosphere on the site that you eroded then you're looking at a net um, movement of carbon from the atmosphere into um, a lithospheric storage so these images kind of conceptualize how this this might look in some of the processes that are going on um, in terms of actually trying to measure this, there's a video here. I have no idea how this is going to go down on Zoom, so let's see. Hopefully you can see a, a very um, full mountain river here in Peru uh, that's carrying huge amounts of sediment. And as part of that sediment load, it's actually also carrying this organic carbon that's been eroded from, from the vegetation and soil of the steep catchment. So to try and work out what's uh, going on in terms of fluxes and controls on those fluxes, uh, we seek to sample that. Um, so this is an example of Catherine Clark's work from that catchment uh, where you've got blue is the water discharge being measured uh, and then the dots are times when we have a sample 
uh, we collect it, we filter it, and we do some geochemistry on it to work out what the carbon is, where it's come from. And, and these approaches have allowed us to build up data sets where we can quantify fluxes. In this case, we could do it over, over kind of events or storm events. We can also do it over, over a period of a year and start to compare catchments and look at what's going on. Um, an example of this in Taiwan uh, is shown here from, from my work, um, showing that suspended sediment yield, which is kind of a, a pretty reasonable proxy for erosion rates, not ideal, um, correlates with this biospheric carbon yield. So this is the carbon just from uh, vegetation and soil that's been eroded. It's been recently photosynthesized and transferred by the river systems. You can see therefore that erosion is really key uh, in this process. Um, Valier Galli um, has compiled um, and provided additional new measurements to really show that this is a global phenomena, this con correlation with um, erosion rates, not just happening in Taiwan at these very high erosion rates, but it's happening elsewhere. And one of the figures in his paper, just to kind of highlight this point, is if you look at the proportion of net primary productivity, which is the vertical axis, this is like basically the amount of the yearly forest growth that the erosion uh, process can remove. Um, you can see that that increases with erosion. And what that's telling you is that um, erosion is driving this whole thing. It's not how much um, carbon the plants uh, produce, it's how much you erode that's setting how much you export and that's already giving us clues that the importance of these geomorphic processes for driving uh, the mobilization in terms of what happens to this stuff uh, well it can be oxidized in various uh, parts of the of this kind of cascade of sediment we're all familiar with um, but one of the things to, to take away from from a lot of work going on in kind of the ocean realm if you like is that if we have high sedimentation rates um, offshore, we can actually preserve a higher proportion of this carbon. This is a, a review paper that summarizes that where we have high sediment accumulation rates um, and we see higher preservation. The SMR box there is small mountainous rivers. These are particular locations where we have high sediment uh, delivery and high preservation of this organic carbon. And actually this is another kind of thing that, that suggests that erosion is it's like a a double push here because erosion allows you to export more of this material from the catchment but erosion allows you to, to export more plastic sediment and by doing so you actually preserve more of the organic carbon offshore um, so there's like a double whammy I guess of, about how erosion plays a role here uh, and then just to highlight some recent work by Sophie Haig where she was looking at this process and actually showing that um, this, this kind of young woody material um, can actually transit through systems um, and here, this is an example of a turbidite deposit. Um, and this is kind of changing, shifting our understanding a bit. That graph I showed, which is behind, is kind of looking at fine-grained um, ocean deposits. This is actually saying that actually in the coarse sand bodies, we can have an awful lot of terrestrial organic matter uh, that we may have missed um, in terms of its transfer into uh, long-lived deposits. So this means that this erosion process can drive the CO2 sink, it's being buried. And actually just to highlight something which is a little bit more uh, kind of um, loose at the moment, but I think there's evidence to say that we, sh we should be pushing this, is that this can act as a negative feedback in a similar way or analogous way to silicate weathering and act to stabilize uh, global climate by the carbon cycle. So if we imagine a landscape like this in the high Andes uh, and we're eroding it, um, what we can actually look, think about is kind of a shear stress um, to erosion. And by doing that, um, this is actually tied to empirical data, you can kind of explore how changes in runoff, either instantaneous runoff or annual runoff, uh, change this yield of um, carbon. So that's the colors here or the vertical axis. Um, as part of this model, um, the other axis here is a, a parameter that's sensitive to the slope of the area that you're eroding. So the higher that number is, the steeper the catchment. Hopefully what you can see from that 3D figure is that if the catchment is steeper and you change runoff, you get more change in carbon uh, flux than you do if the catchment is less steep. That's very analogous to what I explained earlier in terms of silicate weathering. And the other thing we can do is try and play like this, it's pretty crude, but it's a good comparison to make. Again, if we increase annual runoff by 1%, we can increase this carbon yield. And actually, this is much more of an increase than we see for silicate weathering. That was about 0.5%. Here we have a 4% increase. 
and that this work is is showing an, an analogy with that silicate weathering story potentially um, erosion is making um, or very erosive steep catchments are much more sensitive to these changes in climate but what about i've talked now about that those co2 drawdown processes both of the kind of key ones associated with erosion and weathering uh, but what about the co2 emissions and they're really really important in the earth system and um, that we, we're pretty sure they, they must be driving everything and the reason i say that is that if you have an excess in the drawdown of co2 from the atmosphere through silicate weathering or um, organic carbon burial you don't need much of a kind of an excess in this drawdown for it to strip the atmosphere and oceans of co2 very rapidly this was argued by Berner and caldera in the paper in quite a short paper actually just pointing out the need for a mass balance and so the line there that says 25 percent excess in silicate rock weathering that's describing a situation where you have 25 percent increase in one of the outputs from your box so that actually could be organic carbon burial as well and it's showing that very rapidly uh, in less than a million years so in about 500 thousand years you remove co2 from the atmosphere and we, we kind of don't really have any evidence for for that type of thing happening through earth system earth as history um, the flip side is if you increase the release of co2 you can lead to to very high co2 levels again some of those we know uh, haven't happened um, but it, the key thing here is that that co2 output we think that that must be what's driving then the response of the sinks because otherwise you end up if you have a, a net imbalance of the sinks you're just going to keep pulling carbon out of the system and we don't think that that's something that, that's happening so the co2 emissions are really crucial to understand then um, and coming back to this kind of summary figure at the start um, weathering can contribute to additional co2 emissions basically transferring uh, co2 back from the lithosphere back into the atmosphere ocean system um, and combined they're they're larger than the volcanic degassing rate so this is something that can potentially force uh, the earth system so i'll try and um, summarize one of those pathways as i said before rock organic carbon oxidation um, as, a, as a pathway to do this what do we understand about the controls uh, how is it linked to erosion and other factors so i just thought again we'll see how this goes hopefully you're seeing this uh, but this is um, a really nice video of, uh, of a landscape that we might think about here very erosive a lot of uh, bare surfaces exposed by the erosion processes We've got a dominance here of gully erosion. These are these are um, pretty soft sedimentary rocks, marls in the south um, of France and Provence. Um, and the, the erosion here is keeping these rocks exposed to oxygen in the atmosphere, oxygen in surface waters. And that's really a kind of like, you know, basically a hotspot potential for these oxidative weathering reactions that can release CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, so this is kind of one little mini example of where this might process might be happening. But I'm sure you've all seen shells and sedimentary rocks exposed in the field um, in these kind of steep uh, locations and think about, well, you know, if these are reacting, they're releasing CO2. And actually there's two, these two key pathways with these pretty, pretty uh, overly simplified reactions, but they do the job. It's basically the, the first one there is a respiration reaction and you're taking geological organic carbon, very old organic carbon rocks, you're oxidizing it and releasing CO2. The second is if, if we have sulfuric acid uh, reacts with carbonate or reacts with um, bicarbonate in, in water, we can release CO2 and that sulfuric acid is produced by sulf, uh, sulfide oxidation. And that's the that second process, unfortunately, is the one I don't have time to talk about today. Um, but talking about the weathering of this rock organic carbon, again, something I'm sure you've all seen in the field, um, depending on your research interests, you might find this actually quite frustrating because it, it might turn your uh, lovely fossil or your lovely rock that you want to look at geological history with into something that's, that's kind of orange and crumbly. Um, and you can hopefully see this happening on this image where we've got a weathered shale in kind of gray, sorry, um, orangey gray there, and the black shale in, a, in dark color there. This is a very specific type of sedimentary rock, obviously very rich in organic carbon. And we can oxidize that, and that weathering is, is releasing CO2. Um, so clearly a, a logical thing would be to try and measure that. And actually up until recently, that's been pretty challenging because the rates are quite small and carbon is buzzing around in other forms. So actually measuring that directly is quite difficult. So 
Our approach instead has been to say, well, when you oxidize that organic matter, you potentially move other elements associated with the organic matter around. And one of the key ones that we're interested in is rhenium. And the reason for that is that when you oxidize the organic matter, you oxidize the rhenium. And when rhenium is oxidized, it's soluble. It means it, it's dissolving into the pore waters, it's dissolving into stream waters, and it's being carried by rivers out of the, out of the system. So your CO2, you know, goes out, um, it, it gets incorporated into kind of modern biospheric cycles potentially, or just enters the atmosphere. Whereas the rhenium enters the water and we can collect the water and we can calculate the rhenium flux. And the reason for doing, well, looking at rhenium, focusing on rhenium is, is twofold. First uh, is the association of rhenium with organic carbon in sedimentary rocks. And this is happening um, at the site of deposition, essentially, um, as you go into anoxic conditions, you um, immobilize rhenium and you, you trap it in the sediments along with the organic carbon. And when you look at outcrop data, uh, rhenium concentration here against organic carbon concentration, you can see a, a broad relationship. This relationship doesn't hold for other elements. For instance, if you plot this with osmium, it, it doesn't hold because osmium is hosted in other phases other than organic matter. Uh, there's also another key bit of information that we've learned from people who use the rhenium osmium geochronology tool uh, and they can use that tool to actually date hydrocarbon formation uh, and this is because rhenium is not just uh, you know kind of in parallel with the organic matter it's bound or at least a lot of it is bound to the organic material um, and is is you know associated in that intimate way um, and that's really useful for us to use as a proxy because if it's being mobilized it's, you know, we're, we're trying to track the organic carbon. If this um, rhenium is associated with it, then this is a really powerful starting point. The second is when people to how rhenium behaves uh, as these rocks are uplifted and exposed to weathering, they find that, that rhenium is lost while this organic carbon is lost. This is an example from Taiwan, um, but previous work by Puka Ehrenbrink and others um, showed this on various other profiles around the world. <laughs> Uh, and this is an unpublished data set from the Waipu River in, in New Zealand showing the same thing. The two dots are rhenium in the solids and organic carbon from rocks in the solids. And so this coupled loss in the soil from the solid phase is actually being moved. And well, the, the rhenium is disappearing into the dissolve phase and is being carried away from the soils. And that's where we can then go and sample our rivers and say, well, can we use this uh, to quantify uh, rates of weathering? And the way that would work is, is just conceptualized here, that that oxidation rate we could use if we knew something about the flux of rhenium, so that might be some concentration and, and water discharge um, data, and something about the original carbon to rhenium ratio in the rocks that are being weathered. So I'm gonna show you um, some unpublished um, work from, from three rivers, three alpine rivers, that's using this as an example. There's a few others, you, um, case studies, if you're interested in this tool. Um, this is a study where we looked at two paired catchments um, of the WSL's observatory in the Ellenbach and the Vogelbach, um, and also the East River in Colorado. Um, and these were picked because they, the two Swiss catchments have a, have a pairing of very similar geology, similar kind of geomorphic setting, broadly speaking, um, and very similar climate, hydroclimate. Um, the East River has very different rocks, very different hydroclimate, um, and it's kind of, well, if we see something across these alpine catchments, is it telling us something common about the behavior of rhenium in these systems? Um, so we sampled these, and actually I'm showing you the data of rhenium concentration straight up with the gray showing the discharge and the dots showing the, the rhenium concentration. Uh, samples collected approximately over a water year in each of the, the catchment settings. Uh, and what we can do is that of rhenium dissolved in the water and we can compare that to other elements of interest um, and the thing to take away so here I'm always pulling on the x-axis the runoff at the time of sampling so the amount of water um, flowing it's just normalized the catchment area uh, versus a concentration of dissolved species so left hand side is calcium um, the middle is sulfate uh, and the right is rhenium so you can see from calcium perspective these catchments all look pretty similar um, this is a logarithmic plot, but they're still pretty similar, um, which is telling us something broadly speaking about um, the, the kind of makeup of carbonates in these rocks and carbonate weathering. The sulfate 
And the sulfate can derive from sulfide oxidation um, reactions. It can also come in from evaporites, halite, and it can also be anthropogenic. Um, but there's a, there's a really clear separation between the catchments here and the red catchment, the red Swiss catchment has a higher sulfate concentration uh, than the blue switch Swiss catchment for almost all of the samples. There's a few where they overlap. And then on the, the right hand panel, you can see the rhenium and you can again see the separation between the red and the blue Swiss data set. The East River is actually way off the scale. It's got very high rhenium concentration in contrast to the other two. But the, the one I want to kind of draw your attention to is why do those two Swiss catchments have different concentrations? And the first thing we can actually do is say, well, how does this actually translate into flux of rhenium? So the mass of rhenium is being transported. And this is, apologies, a rather dull slide, but hopefully makes a point. And it's comparing these two Swiss catchments. They actually have a big contrast in sediment yield between the pair of them. Um, whereas their, their runoff is pretty similar, as you can see there for the measurement interval that we were interested in. Um, the ratio 1.1 below is pretty similar. So things like calcium, magnesium, uh, and other solutes like that, they actually, the, the difference between the two catchments, you can explain by the difference in the runoff. Uh, so the Ellenbach over the period had slightly more runoff, and so it had slightly more calcium flux. Whereas the sulfate and the rhenium both have elevated fluxes coming out of the Ellenbach. Um, and a, a relatively simple way to explain that is to say that if you increase the erosion rate, you can increase the supply of these phases that deliver sulfate and rhenium, so sulfides and organic carbon in rocks, um, to the oxic weathering zone and, and enhance their fluxes. That's something that we see uh, in Taiwan and catchments in New Zealand as well, that as we increase erosion rate, we increase these oxidative weathering reactions. Um, we can go a step further. We've got this rhenium flux now in the, in, the, in, the load, in the dissolve load. We can actually start to look at where we think this rhenium might be coming from. Um, we use this kind of classic approach of, of looking at ratios of ions here, rhenium sulfate, rhenium sodium, uh, as a way to try and pick apart places where the rhenium may be associated with. So rock organic carbon, high in rhenium and high and, and relatively lower in sulfur and, and sodium. Silicate minerals can contain some rhenium. Um, and so can sulfides. So with this type of mixing approach, we can try and unpack these things. Um, I, won't, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but the mixing domain is showing actually that you've got a real dominance of the rock organic carbon component in all three catchments, uh, most so actually in the East River where the rhenium contents are very high associated with um, high rhenium contents in the, in the rocks and high organic carbon contents in the rocks. But the other thing that's that's in here, I, I kind of I kind of rushed this bit a bit. So hopefully you can spot that there are, there are color changes in these dots uh, in these um, in the stars and the diamonds, and that's associated with discharge. So the more the darker that that fill, the higher the discharge, and the lighter is the lower discharge. Uh, and when you plot the ratios against discharges, you get positive correlations between discharge and rhenium sulfate and discharge and rhenium sodium. And all three catchments behave in a similar way. They show these positive correlations between rhenium sulfate, rhenium sodium and discharge. So to explain this kind of like common behavior, um, we can think about, well, where do we think rhenium is being mobilized in this type of um, alpine catchment? Uh, and this is a conceptual diagram to suggest that, well, we could explain that type of behavior if you're preferentially mobilizing rhenium during events or high charge events. And to do that, that means you're flushing a kind of un previously unsaturated zone uh, where oxidation reactions have been occurring and you flush that um, rhenium that's accumulated over time out of that zone, uh, essentially when you rain on the catchment. Whereas the sulfate and the sodium, um, this is associated more with a deeper reaction front of sulfides, but also sodium from long flow paths, which are needed uh, to break down silicate minerals. You need longer periods of time. So these three catchments have been really useful to try and pick apart where's rhenium coming from, uh, potentially what are the, the pathways in this very straightforward uh, and probably a bit wrong, but in terms of the, you know, the conceptual framework, I think that this is valid in terms of rhenium coming from this oxic uh, zone in these catchments. So in terms of the carbon cycling, what we want to do is actually get to the proxy approach. So I've kind of just 
bypassed a, a couple of steps and just shown you now where we're up to in terms of these are rhenium, mostly rhenium based estimates of the rock organic carbon oxidation. So this is your CO2 release to the atmosphere. And again, against suspended sediment yield, giving us a kind of a proxy for changing erosion. And what you can see on this graph is a broad positive relationship, which is suggesting is if you increase the supply of material um, to oxidize, you can oxidize more of it. But there is considerable scatter, and some of that scatter could simply be due to how much carbon is in the rock, uh, which can vary um, where you sit on here. Um, so that's a, that's a relatively simple explanation. Um, the other explanation is that you have differences um, in the reaction rates that are driven by other factors, potentially local oxygen availability in the weathering zone, um, potentially the role of temperature in these reactions. And these are things that we can't unpack at the moment, but they could be um, very important. But if you squint your eyes, maybe if you're a modeler, you could say, well, actually, I think I could do something with this. Uh, this is actually giving me some constraint on, wh on what's limiting these reactions and how I might think about um, how they work. So let's pull that kind of control together and show what things look like across a kind of similar space. So this is now plotting um, a set of different compilations for silicate weathering on the top left, this biospheric organic carbon erosion and potential burial, which is CO2 sink. And then these two CO2 sources on the bottom by rock organic carbon oxidation um, and the, the carbonate um, associated with sulfide oxidation. Um, and the, the top left-hand panel, this is kind of showing something I've described already, which is that for silicate weathering, there's a bit of this graph where if you increase erosion, uh, you can increase the silicate weathering. But actually, you soon get to a point where you're actually limited by other things, um, limited by temperature and runoff. And on this graph, you can hopefully see that the blue points at higher, high um, erosion rates, the blue points are cooler than the yellow points. And this is fitting this idea that um, there's a kind of temperature limitation to the reactions there. For the second plot on the top, the biospheric organic carbon erosion, you can see that general correlation um, or that general positive relationship. It's slightly less, the slope is slightly less than one. And this could, this could make sense if, if you think about the erosion processes operating. We know that uh, landscapes only get so steep and actually the erosion is then enhanced by going deeper into the landscape um, and so that could that could increase the erosion rate, but going deeper doesn't necessarily increase your biospheric carbon yield. So that's an explanation for why that might be a sublinear scaling. But it's clearly not limited by the amount of soil and vegetation you have around. Um, and then the other two, we've just we're just a little bit less data, so it's a bit less clear to say uh, whether we have other like limitations going on. The other thing I would point out, actually, sorry about the the, the green points in the biospheric carbon it's quite how much variability we have there uh, you know this is logarithmic scale and we've got a lot of variability at a given erosion rate and some of that is linked to actually actually to runoff um, which a couple of papers have suggested but yeah for the bottom two for the for the co2 source uh, yeah we don't quite know as much but isn't this fascinating it means that these co2 sources and sinks are broadly correlated with erosion so your sinks and sources are increasing um, at the same time. So maybe if you're feeling very bold, you might fit some models through these or think about trading off, you know, when does, what erosion rate do we get to when things flip from source to sink? And I would put a bit of a like flashing warning light at the moment and say, please don't, do, well do that. It could be fun, it could be interesting, but there might be other ways to get at that question. So what we were thinking about was actually going to individual points on this graph where on these graphs where we have the, the kind of complementary information and we can try and say, what does this like overall budget look like? So I'm gonna show you an example of trying to piece that together for the Mackenzie River Basin uh, in Canada, a huge river basin that's draining mostly sedimentary rocks. And here we're thinking about moving carbon from the top box, the atmosphere and oceans into the bottom two boxes, which is our lithospheric storage. So there'll be some arrows that try and get carbon down from the atmosphere uh, into storage. And then in the middle, there are kind of like phases, if you like, that we can react. So silicate minerals in pink, uh, carbonate minerals in gray, and organic carbon in the biosphere. We actually also have organic carbon in the rock, which I've talked about, 
And if you oxidize that, that can release CO2. So piecing this together after um, an awful lot of work by various teams in the Mackenzie River Basin, it's not a single study um, piece of work here, looking at silicate weathering, for example, which ends up with arrows going into the bottom box. Don't worry too much about the numbers um, and it might look a bit complicated, but the point is if you've got an arrow, a blue arrow going into the bottom box, you're removing CO2. But actually carbonate weathering can end up with a red arrow going into the atmosphere box. And that's an example of carbonate weathering by sulfuric acid actually releasing CO2. And hopefully you can see straight away that that 0.7 that red arrow going back up is actually much greater than the silicate weathering drawdown in this basin. Um, in terms of the organic carbon cycle, we have very rapid transfer of carbon by photosynthesis and respiration. And some of that can actually leak out of the system through erosion and end up in sediments. And we've quantified that in this basin. You can actually also erode organic carbon from the rocks and not oxidize it. And that's essentially shuttling carbon from a rock on land into, a, into an ocean um, sediment. So that's actually not affecting the modern atmospheric and ocean carbon balance, but is an interesting process nonetheless. And then finally, in this study um, by Kate Haran, the final piece of the puzzle, if you like, was, was to try and get the rhenium-based um, estimate of the organic carbon oxidation. So you piece all these things together, uh, and I don't want to much on, on the arrows and it probably looks really horribly complicated but hopefully you followed what I was getting at here so we can try and get a, like a net when we add all these things together uh, where do we end up moving on from that um, Josh and I pulled together as much as we could information where catchments where we think we could do this uh, in other places and we may have missed some and uh, there are uncertainties on these fluxes some of these fluxes are estimated based on modern day dissolved loads so rhenium, for instance, or sulfate fluxes. Some of the are uh, based on solid loads and there are uncertainties in comparing those two because they may be reflecting different integration times and what, um, what have you. So, you know, there's a bit of a health warning here, but the point is to say, what can we say about those balances? Uh, and hopefully what you can see here, positive values are CO2 emissions, negative values are CO2 um, sinks, CO2 drawdowns. And the, the green bars are the erosion of the organic carbon. The light blue bars are the silicate weathering. So they're giving us our drawdown. Uh, on, the, on the emission side, we've got weathering of organic carbon in rocks as gray bars. And we've got the dark blue bars as our sulfide oxidation. And these combine to make the little dot with the pink, um, the pink whisker. So this is our net transfer. And I've just ordered them by the net yield. So what can we take away from this? There's not very many studies, um, and the, some of them are sources, some of them are sinks. But um, if we break them out a little bit more, there are some messages that, that start to become um, clearer. And that's the first one is if you have a volcanic setting, you don't have the sedimentary oxidative weathering outputs. And so this is a place where clearly you can, you can build a CO2 sink um, that is quite significant. These are also places where silicate weathering um, rates can be very high. Again, there's only one catchment where we've we put this together for with in terms of pairing the fluxes. So um, we could learn an awful lot more by looking more broadly or quantifying these things elsewhere. And then there's in terms of the sedimentary rocks, if we've got low sulfide contents, we don't tend to have these dark blue bars. If we've got high sulfur contents, we have these dark blue bars. And when they combine with the gray bars, you end up pushing some of these systems towards CO2 sources. Um, so, okay, so just going back, so think, how can we move on from here? What might cause these balances to shift uh, one way or another? And so there's some information that's come out of, again, single kind of location studies. This is um, the Southern Alps of New Zealand where Kate Haran looked at rhenium to try and uh, understand the oxidative weathering processes. And she found that the dissolved rhenium concentrations were highest in these two catchments that have the highest amount of modern day uh, glacial coverage. Uh, and this is actually partly mirrored in the other data, whereby um, as the glacial area increases, we find more rhenium in the, in the water uh, and therefore more rhenium flux. And so this paper suggested that maybe you could switch these catchments from CO2 sinks to sources. Again, apologies, the colors are different here, but the idea is the same. Um, you can switch from CO2 source to CO2 sink associated with this glaciation, mountain glaciation process. Um, 
we speculate that this is probably due to at least three different factors. Um, the first being that you're exposing rocks uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, there's very little vegetation growth, so you can have atmospheric oxygen interacting directly with rocks in gas form or water. Uh, the second is you have like these glacial processes and frost shattering processes that are producing lots of fine grain material that can react uh, when it's um, in contact with water and air very rapidly. Uh, and the third is that you have probably primary succession going on in a set of microbial communities that may use that organic matter um, as, a, as essentially as a food source. So there's these kind of interesting reasons why these catchments might have higher oxidative weathering fluxes. And actually Mark Torres around the same time was uh, found very similar uh, arguments in terms of the sulfide oxidation rates and found and suggested from global data sets that uh, this glaciation can actually lead to this increase in the sulfide oxidation too. So these two different pathways of CO2 release through weathering, oxidative weathering, um, there's a very similar story actually between them and they came up with this very very um, simple way to view this in terms of the earth system where glaciation would increase sulfide oxidation which would increase co2 and actually act as a negative feedback to to cooling actually so to to kind of stop the earth system kind of um, headlonging into um, low co2 world so you increase the co2 flux as you increase the the area, the, the glaciation uh, process so this is still you know the, these are um, mostly modern data and, and thinking about what kind of processes could be operating. So there's an awful lot still to learn about uh, the controls on these weathering fluxes. I'm just going to end with that just suggests a way that we might be able to look at these fluxes more directly. Uh, so this is some example of what we've been doing in the, in the French um, Draxplian Critical Zone Observatory. Uh, where we've actually been trying to, instead of using something like rhenium uh, or sulfate as our way to quantify these weathering reactions carried by the river water, we're actually trying to look at the CO2 that's being released um, from outcrops, essentially. So here we're, we're creating a chamber within a, a naturally fractured um, rock face that's undergoing weathering, and we're measuring the CO2 that builds up uh, and trying to quantify flux and also confirming where that carbon's coming from. So just an example from a, a single visit to one of these chambers where we can quantify a flux and we can trap the gas, um, we measure its radiocarbon activity to work out where it's come from. And so this is quite exciting because it means that we can visit um, a site and we can try and build up um, a measurement series of fluxes um, about how hydrology and climate controls these emissions. Okay, otherwise, to take a bit of a, bit of a step back um, in terms of mountains erosion, what am I going to give you as the take home message? And the take home message would be, um, it's not that simple and um, erosion and weathering can combine in a way that could lead to your mountain belt being quite neutral in terms of CO2 uh, balance or could combine in a way to be a strong sink. And that would also depend on the climatic setting of your, your mountain range. And that could either be in terms of latitude, so in, in terms of a single time period where you build your mountain range, but also in terms of when you build your mountain range, um, in terms of the kind of climatic evolution of, um, of Earth's history. But some key messages, I think, is that, that the organic carbon burial is a really key pathway. Sorry, I should just, I just should explain the figure before I <laughs> do that, uh, which is that we, we split here volcanic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and the volcanic rocks can be really potent CO2 sinks in these erosive environments. Um, and they could be very sensitive to changes in temperature. Whereas the sedimentary rocks, we could have more of these CO2 sources, and we don't really yet know how that might respond to um, changes in climate. Um, but this is a really interesting feature that kind of, of the surface and, and actually also leads to questions about how a mountain range in itself may evolve uh, as, the, as the kind of initial collision arc volcanism gives way to um, collision and convergence and uplift of sedimentary rocks um, and metamorphic rocks. So in terms of some take homes, I would say that the first one is that organic carbon burial is, is a really important pathway. In some of these catchments we've looked at, almost all of them, uh, this was the main pathway of CO2 sequestration. Um, and this mirrors uh, findings from the Himalaya from, from the uh, late 90s that made this point as well. And so that's something we really need to get, get a handle on. Um, also, in terms of this climatic feedback, if it's done via silicate weathering, mountains are places where this is most sensitive to, to climate. Um, so mountains allow you to, to have silicate weathering feedback that operates um, 
in its most sensitive form. And this may also be true for the organic carbon burial, but I think there needs to be more work to unpack that. And then this, this idea of lithology being really important. If we've got a mountain belt made of shales, uh, we may actually end up with a CO2 um, source from these sulfide oxidation and organic carbon oxidation reactions that starts to negate what silicate weathering and organic carbon burial are doing. Uh, in terms of moving forwards, this is my final slide. Um, I think that hopefully you probably see my, <laughs> I would advocate for this, of course, because I'm trying to do some of this myself, but um, we do need more measurements of these sulfide oxidation reactions uh, in terms of fluxes, but also in terms of understanding um, kind of reaction kinetics, what's limiting them, uh, where are they happening? And the where are they happening is kind of part of the geomorphic link as well. So this is some really important questions about the role of uh, floodplains, uh, in terms of if your mountain belt feeds into a floodplain and your sediment has a longer residence time there, what does that mean for the net carbon transfers? Um, the role of landslides, these are you know, events that can produce a lot of fractured material, uh, can kind of pool water, and various people have pointed out that they can be really important for carbonate silicate weathering. What about the oxidative weathering reactions as well? I think we're learning that they are also important for those too. And then finally, I think we've got an opportunity here to try and see a kind of a numerical modeling um, experiment where we can see how these things trade off and start to understand how they might play off on longer time scales that it's really difficult to, to get at um, from, from just looking at modern catchments as I've focused on in this talk. So um, yes, that's uh, where I'd like to to conclude uh, and yeah thank you for I, I've had the very strange very common zoom occur feeling of just speaking to myself in my, in, uh, yeah so hopefully you're all still there uh, and if you've got any questions or comments I'd be happy to to field them so thank you Okay, thanks a lot to Bob for this uh, inspiring talk on the visit through uh, different landscapes. I will try to open the, the chat. So I think the chat is now open to uh, all participants. Uh, so if there's any question, uh, you can type or you can raise your hand with the participant button. Um, so we are waiting for people to, to chat and um, I have a first question um, which is coming back to do your, your, the, the Swiss catchments where you see this uh, same climatic um, the same climatic setting the, diff the same lithology but the very different um, sediment yield and thus um, the, the carbon, uh, the carbon also oxidation. So, how do you? What is making this difference in sediment yield if runoff and lithology is very similar? What, uh, maybe I missed that. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't mention it at all. And um, the reason for that is, and I wonder if actually there's there's better people to answer this on the call, but I'll do my best. Um, the Allenbach has a drape of till, so the more erosive catchment. Has actually got a, a deposit um, over the bedrock. It's actually relatively complicated when you're moving through the how this actually works. Uh, but the reason for the high sediment yield in the Allenbach is the erosion of this fine grain material um, that's not present in the uh, Volgenbach on the other side of the valley, essentially. Uh, so the difference in the erosion rate reflects that um, kind of superficial uh, geology. Um, and yeah, so it kind of gives you, it's not an ideal case because the difference in, in, in erosion is associated with a kind of di di slightly different substrate, um, but it is a contrast in erosion nonetheless. And it's an explanation for well, why, why should rhenium be higher? Why should sulfate be higher in that catchment? That's, you know, you can see them from, from each other. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? So it's kind of associated with sufficial uh, geology essentially. Okay. Thanks. So we're still waiting for the question. Steffi or Philippe, do you have any? Ah, yeah, there's one. Okay, I can take this first one. Um, so there's a question from Sean Willett, uh, uh, who's saying, nice talk, Bob. Could you comment on the utility of making flux measurements with such variable timescales processes? 
I'm thinking particularly on holocene versus longer time scale process rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that would be, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that for silicate weathering has been a real push, like how do we do this? We've got ways to look at weathering intensity. So that can, you can look at your solid residue uh, and you can say, well, how much weathering do I think has happened? So what proportion of that solid has been altered? That gives me like a percentage. But weathering intensity is not the same as flux. And to get to flux, you need to know about the overall denudation rate. And so there has been, I think there was a, there was a paper earlier this year, or at the end of last year, uh, by a group in Oregon, uh, where they were combining beryllium-10 um, in detrital materials with estimates of weathering intensity. This was for silicate weathering. So they were, they were therefore potentially able to try and back that out. Um, and I would advocate for something similar in terms of these oxidative weathering reactions. If we can get a way of, of looking at you know, past intensity of weathering from the, the residual solid, uh, then we can do that. The flip side, which we're quite excited about, we don't know if this is gonna work, um, but is to look at the actual dissolved products that you produce and then you actually record in deposits. So what we're thinking about specifically here is rhenium and its isotope system and the potential that the rhenium isotope system, say, delivered to a lake, um, or, I mean, I guess maybe also a, a deltaic region, but a lake would be simpler, um, is being set by uh, the weathering intensity um, in the upland catchment. And if you have a phase that records the, the composition of that in the sedimentary record, then you can go back and look at that over the types of timescales that you're referring to, because those timescales are ones where we can get we should be able to get, if we choose our records, a good chronology constraint. Um, and you know, we know climates change from the, from the glacial to the Holocene. So it is a useful um, tool. But for the oxidative weathering reactions, uh, it's a bit early to say, I, I think. It was a very long answer. I can't see the chat either, so sorry okay. about that. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'll just continue. Um, so there has been another more like a common than a question and it's from David Leubel saying thanks for the interesting talk. Um, in the context of anthropogenic climate change, I think it is important to highlight that the effectiveness of the negative feedback caused by deglaciation is by far not sufficient to counteract current CO2 emissions. So yeah, maybe you can quickly comment on the comment <laughs> if you want. A absolutely. Um, in, the, in this paper I was flagging um, I, I try and be very clear about this when we're writing papers. You know, the, 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 the oxidation reaction we're talking about is the one that's been hugely accelerated by burning fossil fuels. So we're talking about 40 to 100 as the natural oxidation rate, uh, and fossil fuel burning is delivering over 9,000 megatons of carbon per year. So, you know, there's just these reactions are going to, they're going to potentially well, silicate weathering is, is going to help mop up some of this, but we're talking, you know, thousand years in the future, it's going to start to play a role in, you know, if we stopped emissions today, it would still be playing a role in removing that CO2. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I completely agree. The, the, the flip side to that, though, is carbonate weathering and sulfuric acid weathering. This can be very rapid and we don't have a good handle on how large this flux is. And there was a recent paper uh, looking at permafrost slumps where permafrost thaw has exposed till, uh, this is by Zolkos et al. And that shows that that can release, uh, well, the, the CO2 release from that process can be more rapid than the degradation of the peat organic matter. So in terms of the anthropogenic story, it could be that some of these weathering reactions end up being additional leaks out of the system. How large they are, I don't know, um, but I would I, I'd definitely be very clear that we're talking otherwise about how the carbon cycle is, is operating, um, you know, kind of in the absence of anthropogenic activity. Okay, thanks. Just a quick comment for you, Bob. If you go actually with the mouse to the bottom of your screen, um, you should be able to activate the chat yourself. Oh, okay. And it might be easier for you as well if you can read. Yeah, it would be great to read the track. Um, it's not showing up on my, oh, there we go. Okay, uh, maybe if I try and, maybe if okay. I stop sharing my screen, I don't think it's, entirely necessary to be doing that um oh yeah okay oh wow um you have another question uh, bob thanks for, yep. for this talk uh, a question by bruno colavito uh, mm -hmm. from argentina he's saying thank you very much for this uh, interesting talk uh, 
uh, he's hoping he didn't get uh, your uh, message wrong, but under the, the model you use, could someone interpret that human-induced uh, organic carbon erosion and burial will be a negative feedback for CO2 in the atmosphere? Uh, actually, there's, so again, it's kind of linked to the other question. I mean, yes, but the fluxes are small, so um, it's not going to you know, save the day. But there has been significant work done on trying to understand what we call the land sink of anthropogenic CO2 and the way that erosion might be affecting that. So um, there's some great work by um, Berhe and Stallard and various others um, who were trying to get at that. And then more recently, um, there's a group in EPFL or Lausanne, I forget um, the PI, uh, but who have, have looked at this question um, kind of almost as a, a question of agricultural pr practices. How is this actually transferred carbon um, around the landscape and actually potentially has, has accumulated some anthropogenic CO2? Um, but clearly, you know, this, this, is, this is not going to impact the current rates of emissions that we, we have. Um, so yeah, that, it's a, that's a very important topic and there's been a lot of work done, especially thinking about uh, uh, agricultural landscapes and uh, that type of land use. Yeah. Okay, the next question is also um, from uh, Fang Liang Li. Hi Bob, I'm confusing about the role of OC cycle in the multi-million years scale. As these reactions involve the O2 evolution, I guess. My question is, do you think the OC burial versus oxidation will be a driver for the Cenozoic cooling? That's a tough one. And um, this is being recorded, isn't it, and put on YouTube. So I guess I could say something super controversial and see if like three people watch it. Um, now, I, uh, the first question about oxygen is, is really important. I didn't mention it at all in my talk, but two of the reactions, uh, three of the reactions, sorry, are really critical for uh, cycling oxygen around. The current oxygen content at the atmosphere is, is very high, so that these carbon cycle perturbations are kind of buffered by that. So actually, um, again, you need long time scales of these, of these processes out of balance to affect oxygen. In terms of the Cenozoic, um, I'd say the Cenozoic carbon cycle questions and the links to erosion are still very much open. Um, there was, as I mentioned in my talk, this is a really nice nature paper last year. Uh, by caves and others um, trying to get at this from a kind of silicate weathering feedback uh, kind of question. Whether the organic carbon cycle has been playing a role uh, is something that is still a, an open question. Um, it partly relates to Sean's question as well about having good records of how these things have changed through time. It's very well going to modern catchments and looking at how these things behave, but actually seeing how you know, a kind of coherent record of, of, of global change is panning out. Uh, that's quite difficult. So I'm, I don't have an answer for the Cenozoic other than um, the Himalayan case study. I think there's, that's pretty compelling that the way, if the Himalaya are impacting the carbon cycle, they're probably doing it mostly through eroding terrestrial carbon and burying it in the Bay of Bengal. And I think that that is, that's getting to a point where that's pretty, pretty firm so um, how much I don't know and rates and how they've changed but yeah. So there is um, a next question by uh, Eric Lajeunesse so you will have the, the French accent uh, anyway. Um, so thank you for this very uh, stimulating talk. I have a very naive question for you. Uh, you, point uh, you point to volcanic rocks as a carbon sink. Does this, does this estimate also take into account for the carbon released by the volcano when active? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I'm sorry, I'm just smiling because it's so nice to see all the list of people that I haven't seen at conferences actually for a while. So <laughs> hello, Eric. Um, anyway, um, no, it doesn't. So we don't put that into the loop because I suppose you should, but how to do it seems a bit complicated. So um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know quite. I think I think if you're thinking about like diffuse degassing over a catchment, then it seems to make sense that maybe you could try and incorporate that into the estimate. But if it's a point source, it, it, some, it, 
I don't know whether that's a fair comparison. So for instance, you know, Etna, which is this massive CO2 emission because it's diffuse and it's, it's happening all the time. I forget what percentage Etna is of global volcanic CO2 emissions, but it's quite large. And that basaltic area around the, the you know, the, that area is clearly not sequestering as much CO2 as, the, as Etna is emitting. So I wonder if it's by doing that, you might have a bit of... Um, misleading picture about what's going on because the volcanism is associated with these point sources and so it probably makes more sense to collect them all together and say this is the average um, but I think it's a really interesting question especially if you have diffuse CO2 uh, and actually that di that diffuse CO2 is actually interacting with the rocks as it moves up through the, the pile and actually potentially playing a role in the weathering reactions as well um, so yeah, I don't have a firm answer for you there but that's some thoughts Um, okay, so the next question is from Mikhail Stilas. I hope that was correct. Um, in the same wavelength of your talk, what are the most recent findings about carbonate weathering and its contribution to CO2 sources sinks? I'm just thinking about the Mediterranean basin and its long history and subtropals. Any relation between carbonate erosion, denudation and organic rich layers? Mm. And he thanks you for the nice talk. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's a really interesting question. I, um, I didn't talk about carbonate weathering because we often, for a carbon cycle perspective, we often think about if we have carbonic acid as the weathering agent, um, we often think of this as a bit of a closed loop. So carbon gets sequestered when you weather the carbonate, but then it gets released when you make new carbonate, and you're kind of in a balance. Um, I mentioned if you have sulfuric acid doing the weathering, this can be a different story. Um, and we kind of need more studies to understand that more broadly. Um, but there is some interest in carbonate weathering uh, in the modern day um, and, and, and whether it's, it's been enhanced. Um, we also think that erosion is, is important here as well, because if you increase erosion, you can in increase the supply of carbonate minerals to react with. So it's definitely playing a role. Um, in terms of then linking it to organic carbon burial in like the marine realm, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. I, I might speculate that what's, for the marine organic carbon burial, the way that this is conceptualized is that weathering actually delivers nutrients um, such as phosphate and calcium, oh, well, mainly phosphate actually, sorry, what am I talking about? Delivers phosphate to the um, marine realm um, by silicate weathering, and that can then enhance um, the production of organic material in the ocean and its potential burial. Um, so I would probably conceptualize more that in terms of the marine organic carbon burial, it might be more sensitive to changes in silicate weathering. Um, hope that answers your question somewhat. There's a next question from Kai Deng. Uh, about thanks for your fascinating review. Would you provide some comments on the role of glacial interglacial runoff changes in carbon budget? During glacial times, how do tropical subtropical mountain beds with minor glacial cover respond to the runoff decrease? Is taking Taiwan as an example, the net carbon release flux will decrease there, and if so, it may be a positive feedback to climate cooling because there is less carbon. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. And back to almost the first question about when you know we really need some data from uh, from these kind of records. I think for Taiwan, uh, the current thinking is that as you as you um, as you're in the glacial conditions, you have less typhoon impacts, right? So you have lower runoff. Um, now, how that affects the CO2 sequestration and the CO2 sources, um, I don't know if we have any data yet. There's a few bits of data from Shu uh, Shuji Gao's Tree Gao's group um, that are published, and I know that there's a few PhD students working on detrital records uh, that that look really interesting, but nothing's out. Yeah, and I wouldn't have a definitive answer. And I also wouldn't know. Um, so yeah, changing runoff could change your sinks, could reduce your sinks, but changing runoff could also influence the, um, the CO2 sources. And it's, the, it's this question of the ratio and how you move these, these bars around in ratio, I guess. And that's something that, um, yeah, I don't have an answer for yet. Be great to know. There is a, a nice uh, a next question, sorry, by uh, Xingu. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. 
It's a nice talk. In the mixing model to identify the source of rhenium, uh, did you use the total sulfate and sodium concentration in, stre in stream water? Mm -hmm. And does the anthropogenic input change the uh, calculation? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so it, it's uh, yeah the um, the sulfate deposition in the Swiss catchments has been declining, um, kind of as as many catchments are, have experienced. I'm um, so actually a co-author on that on that paper gave me a bit of a ticking off because I I was simplifying um, how that sulfate story worked in those Swiss catchments. So at the moment, those plots I showed you don't make any attempt to correct for anthropogenic. Uh, sulfate inputs and, and release. Um, actually, what they would end up doing, if you included them, you would end up concluding that more, even more of the dissolved rhenium was coming from um, the, the rock sources. And the reason I say that is that we have precipitation samples from the Swiss catchments and we can't measure any rhenium in those samples. So the rhenium content of that material is so low, we just can't measure it. Now that might be different in other places. If you're in a place where you're very near to, for example, coal burning or something like this, then you could deposit rhenium um, at the same time as you're getting, say, sulfate, um, sulfur de deposition as well. Uh, but for the sulfur story in these catchments, yeah, we can make those calculations and actually what it ends up doing is, is pushing you to say that even more of the rhenium comes from the rock um, because some of the sulfate doesn't come from the rock. I hope that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so um, the next question is from Kiran Kumar Reddy. Shilingi Reddy, I hope that was <laughs> even close to correct. Uh, what is the role of tectonics? So the scenario, um, the scenario is same for active and passive mountains and the role of lithology. So igneous versus sedimentary rocks. Um, I didn't talk, I didn't get to talk about that. I do apologize. We've been trying to think about how active mountain belts, you know, what's what's potentially different about those. And actually one of the, the key features um, in, in these types of settings is the potential for one-off very widespread landslide triggering events by earthquakes. Um, and this could be a feature of, of active tectonic mountain ranges, that, you know, where you've got the fault associated with the topography. Um, triggering large amounts of landslides in kind of one go. Um, this is a feature that could actually enhance some of these reactions and impact the carbon cycling in a way that a passive um, or I guess uh, an ancient topography, uh, it, it may not. Um, but in, in the broader sense, you can think of it in terms of the erosion story. So if you know, I don't want to open the can of worms that is tectonics, climate and erosion, because there's people <laughs> heading up this call who will shoot me down, I'm sure. But, um, you know, that is another way that, that active tectonics is playing a role because active tectonics can fuel these, help fuel these uh, high erosion rates. And erosion is key, as I showed today, in setting some of the, the, the rates of, of reactions and carbon transfers. And then in terms of the lithology in igneous and sedimentary rocks, that all comes down to the CO2 sources from oxidative weathering. And if you've got sulfides or rock organic carbon in your rocks, which is most likely to be sedimentary rocks, you can obviously have some magmatic sulfides actually in some settings. Um, you can, uh, they can produce these CO2 sources, whereas the igneous rocks uh, may be uh, more prone to being these net sinks. I would actually take the opportunity to ask a question myself, which is very general and probably quite simple. But um, you were saying in the end of your talk that one of the challenges that we have is basically to get more data, get more measurements. So my question is, is this the main issue these days? So are we just lacking data to quantify the different processes? Or is it also possible, possible that our list of processes that we're looking at are not complete yet? So in the past, we're start saying silicon weathering as a big um, CO2 sink, but then figured out there's also CO2 sources in weathering. So, so just your idea, do you think there could be major processes still missing in the whole balance? Or are we pretty much aware of most of the major processes and it's just a matter of quantification these days? <laughs> it's, not, it's not a simple question or, or no, I think that's a great question. And I, um, I, I, 
I, do, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think if you if you look at the way the silicate weathering uh, kind of community of literature, if you like, the, its trajectory, the way it's it, that it's moved forward since the 80s when people were writing these papers saying silicate weathering is this is this crucial CO2 um, pathway. Silicate weathering is obviously really important for other reasons, you know, in terms of nutrient delivery um, and and water chemistry. And drinking water and stuff like this is obviously really key uh, as well. But for the for this kind of theme of mountains and erosion, the specific question of like these steep locations and what reactions are happening there, I think the one that I didn't mention uh, is the role of high temperature metamorphic processes uh, and how that feeds into this story as well. Um, and that's something that a few people have had a, a stab at and would suggest that it's important. Um, it's 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 broadly related to mountain building, but haven't we didn't really discuss it today because of the focus on like the sufficient erosion processes. Uh, and then in terms of your other question about like well more measurements, and it's a, I guess I'm a bit wary of saying that sometimes because it sounds like a really like obvious thing to say we just need more data. But I would stand by that for the oxidative weathering reactions because um, again if you look at what the silicate weathering community has been able to do, they've had this empirical data. Uh, say river catchment scale, but there's also just fantastic data at like kind of almost grain scale and and you can take this journey and really understand what what the reactions are happening and we're starting to get that same journey for oxidative weathering. For example, the Shell Hills Observatory is looking at like this shale that contains pyrite uh, and we're thinking and there's been an awful lot of work done, you know, grain scale thinking about fracturing and and really um, trying to understand the processes at play. But then if you want to scale up, you know, you need the catchment data to help you constrain how you do that. So I think the more data you can populate um, with, the better you can try and um, build either like process-based models or, or more empirical models to try and test test that um, and those ideas. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I think there is no more question in the chat. Um, Philippe, Steffi, you're fine too. Okay, well, well. I, I actually would have another one <laughs> since we have <laughs> the opportunity. Again, a, like a more general one. So how, yeah, how do you basically distinguish between a sink and a source? So where's the, the, the threshold basically? So when I have organic material that is attached to sediment, so once it's deposited on the shelf, let's say, is it, is it like this is, is this the sink? Is it the CO2 sink? Because there can be further processes like oxidation and it can be released again, right? So, so how do you actually define sink and source? Um, it's a great question. We've been um, thinking about this from a kind of the other side of the coin, actually. So like thinking about a landslide and a landslide eroding soil and vegetation, um, it hasn't, hasn't produced a carbon sink at that point. It's just moved carbon that was there to there so it hasn't hasn't done anything yet so actually what's the time scale over which you produce the sink is actually when you start to recolonize the the landscape um, and at the same time as recolonizing the landscape you start to move that that carbon through the system uh, and so you can kind of we've played around with some some empirical models to say well that that sink is going to play out over like hundreds of years because you need hundreds of years to to build up your um, your vegetation and, and soil back on the erosion site, if you like. Um, and then in terms of, so, hope, so that answers hopefully one part of the question, which is I think you can start to talk about um, when, what, it, yeah, when does this become a CO2 sink? And that that's one of those questions. Then in terms of the fate of, a, of that material as it moves through, for example, a floodplain system, um, or if it's in the delta. Um, again, there's been a lot of work done in deltaic systems to look at uh, this incineration of organic matter that can happen in some systems that are very mobile in terms of the sediments moving through that and you can almost entirely replace the organic matter that comes from the, the land with marine organic carbon and this is going to sound a bit weird but actually if you just replace it you've still got a net sink because you eroded it from land replaced that organic matter on land it came down, you oxidized it, but you actually replaced all of it again with, with marine organic matter. So you actually did still sequester it. And then the final part of the story is the, is the, like, the fate in that, in that diagenetic zone. Um, and that is something that 
that lots of int people are interested in for different reasons. You know, it's really important for benthic e ecosystems, and we know that carbon is remineralized. Um, but we also know that there's a point when carbon stops, you stop losing or you lose negligible amounts of carbon and you've basically sequestered it. Uh, and that's probably over time scales of, of thousands to tens of thousands of years. So hence why we're, we, try, we try and be quite careful when we describe these erosion pathways because they are playing out over longer periods of time, um, which are interesting to us as, as geologists and geomorphologists. Uh, but in terms of kind of like the short term uh, carbon cycle, you know, annual timescales or, or, or tens of years. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a different story in terms of which processes are important for the carbon cycle. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, thanks a lot. And also thanks for the really nice talk. Well, thanks. Thanks. Well, and thanks for the organizers. That was such a great, um, when I saw the email, I was just like, that's just a, a wonderful idea. Um, so well done for putting it together and um, hopefully you can keep it uh, keep it going because it's been a really nice block of, of talk so far. So well done. Thanks a lot, Bob. Yes, I joined uh, Steffi. It was really nice and uh, inspiring talk. I think there is no more chat questions. So I think we will be soon to close up. There's one. There's one question from uh, Gerhard Rab. Okay. Thank you for the great talk. In regard of your chemical tracing, vibranium, calcium, etc., how do you deal with remobilized elements of transient deposition zones? Um, this is a similar question for, for sulfate as well, actually. We don't know how much sulfate potentially gets reduced and immobilized. Um, we can't at the moment. One of the tools we're hoping to look at is rhenium isotopes because the isotopes um, fractionate with redox process. So you could potentially observe that type of process. One argument I might make is if you've got a longer enough record from your river is that you should be able to capture um, transients of that type of nature. Now, whether that transients is happening over a storm event or whether it's happening over uh, seasonal timescales, I can't um, answer that. But I, I guess I, I would say our approach would be to try and sample a river long enough that that type of uh, immobilization and remobilization um, you've kind of captured um, by your sampling campaign. Again, hopefully that answers your question. But it's a really interesting idea and I'm sure it's happening because these elements are very redox sensitive and they can be immobilized when you go anoxic. So, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, I think this is time now to, to close the discussion. And uh, as Bob has put his email, we can continue the discussion through email. And uh, I would like to thank you, Bob, again for your talk and for, for responding to our invitation. It was really, really nice to see a geochemistry of surface uh, processes. And um, don't, uh, don't forget the next week's seminar for the, for the audience, if you can attend to. We'll be pleased to have you uh, on board. Uh, thank you again, Bob. Thanks to everybody for being still there and uh, hope to see you in, uh, in person for the next uh, conferences. Thanks, everybody. Um, have a good day or good afternoon or even good night. <laughs>